Well, it's obvious to tell I'm not Joan Maynard. I'm sure, it's the accent. Joan is down with, she thinks it feels like the flu, but she had her flu shot, so she's not quite sure what it is, but she was not able to be here today. But she had really wanted to preach. She's, you know, had been out of the pulpit for a while, and she felt up to getting back in and, and preaching today. And, and this was important to her. And she spent all week preparing a very nice text for you today. And so I thought that the best thing would be to share with you Joan's text. And you can use your excellent imaginations and imagine it to be Joan. So do a bit of reader's theater here, taking me back to college, and uh, here we, I won't attempt the accent. disciples, which we heard this morning. For many of you, the response may be a tired yawn. Change the reader, change the biblical translation, change the emphasis on certain words, and perspective can change. Do you see what I see? Do you hear what I hear? Asks the words to a Christmas song. Do we see a needy newborn dependent on others for life? Or do we see a man hammered to a cross offering life to others? What was it that motivated Jesus to call four fishermen to accompany him and share his life? What motivated the four to leave the life they knew to follow an inherent rabbi into the unknown? Most cattle ranchers don't desire to become theology professors at Yale. A yawn may be your response to a tired topic. But let's take a second, admittedly speculative look at the story together. Immediately preceding the call story is the account of Jesus being cast into the wilderness for 40 days and being tested by Satan. We are so accustomed to think of Jesus as divine, the perfect Son of God, that we skip over his humanity through the decree we recite each week says that Jesus was made man. He was both completely human as well as divine. Maybe trapped in the wilderness with an evil spirit, Jesus decided some company on his mission would be a plus, sort of a first century support group. But why fishermen? And what caused Andrew, Peter, James, and John to follow? In the ancient Near East, people fished for fun. Egyptians fished for food and finance. For the Hebrews, fishing was a job. Though fish were abundant, it was hard work. And one of the Greek word for fish translates as monster. For several ancient cultures, fish had a religious connotation, and a fish creature was part of myths. In Egypt, fish decorated sacred vessels. In Assyria, Ai was the fish god, and the priest dressed in a fish garment. Fish oil was used to light sanctuary lamps, shining lights into the darkest corners. Sacred fish lived in the Chalcis River in Syria. The goddess Deserto was half fish and half woman. The sea represented chaos and was fraught with danger. Large monstrous creatures, probably some type of whale, inhabited the depths. Fishing was not a profession for the timid, a trait that would come in handy in post-resurrection ministry. Jesus knew 
that effective ministry is a group effort. In words of the gradual hymn, in Christ all souls are one in him. We are created to respond to Christ's call. Example of different perspective, Zebedee stands in the sea, probably in his altogether, as speedos had not yet been invented. He alone was hanging on to the fishing net as his two sons, his heirs, his business partners are running down the road, joyfully shouting to join the new movement of the charismatic rabbi. The rabbi spoke and his sons left him and followed, leaving Zebedee to manage the nets by himself. I thought about preaching on care of the elderly parent, <laughs> but another day. In early Christian times, the fish was the decorative sacred symbol, but also a sign of identity in a hostile world. Another Greek word for fish became an acronym for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior. Sometimes a second look reveals what we would have preferred to remain hidden, substance abuse, family discord, disturbing health warnings, ethnic violations. But Jesus looks past the window dressing, the exterior gloss, the public persona, and sees the heart at our center. He sees us as we, we were created to be, and he pronounces us good. As long as even a tiny flame burns within the center of darkness, there is hope. May we always pray to see beyond the black holes of indescribable hate and evil, to see the face of Jesus in all that we meet. Last week, Paul asked that each of us spend time praying and thinking how God is calling each of us individually and collectively as a church to be disciples, to affect the kingdom of God which is at hand to bring about the beloved community in which we're called to live. What are our gifts? How can we best be Jesus in a fractured world? If we see a young woman with a scarf, head covering, do we immediately see a Muslim terrorist or a person wearing a religious symbol as we would wear a cross? Hearing a Spanish speaker, does our mind say, Illegal or neighbor? A young teen mom? Welfare or an opportunity to minister? The list is as endless as our prejudice. prejudices, maybe. Just because we are not listening doesn't mean God isn't calling. Pray that we may be led by the Holy Spirit to see beyond the veneer and veil of every darkness knowing that with God in charge, ultimately, light will prevail, enlightening the darkest of souls in the darkest of places. Amen. Amen.